Rise and respect the Christ in the reading of the gospel. The Holy Gospel for this morning is from Mark chapter 6, beginning with the 45th verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. And immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret, and moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, the people immediately recognized him, and ran about the whole region, and began to bring the sick people on their beds to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he came, in villages, cities, or countryside, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his garment. And as many as touched it were made well. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Grace, mercy, and peace to you in the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus. Story about a little boy who's uh, afraid of the dark. Uh, and he's in the kitchen helping his mom, and his mom wants him to go to the pantry and get, you know, a can of tomatoes. And he doesn't want to go to the pantry because it's dark in the pantry. And she reminds him, Jesus is with you. Go get him. And so he heads over to the pantry door, and then he just gets a thought. He opens the door. He kind of sticks his hand in there and says, Jesus, if you're in there, please hand me the tomatoes. <laughs> you know, fear. Fear is one thing that, that, that controls us. We uh, have the disciples being terrified for their lives as they see Jesus walking on the water. They don't know that it's him. And, and of course, it's his love and his words that take care of them and provide them peace and comfort that it's going to be okay. Uh, and and there are when it comes to things that bring fear to us, there is a huge list, and I happen to have one here, a couple of them. Uh, this is top ten fears of 2023. Uh, I'm going to run through them kind of quick. Number ten: not having enough money for the future. Cyber terrorism, biological warfare, pollution of drinking water, people I love dying. People I love become seriously ill. The U.S. becoming involved in another world war. Russia using nuclear weapons. Economic financial collapse and corrupt government officials. Most of those are pretty much exterior things. Uh, worldwide type of things for the most part. But then there's this other list of all the normal things that are kind of everyday stuff somewhat. Well, not really everyday. Well, the first one on this is demons and ghosts. People are afraid of them. Uh, I still remember as a kid, uh, being young, uh, going through the house, looking out a window that was through a dark room and seeing something that scared me to death. I thought I saw something out there that was not human. Still remember that to this day. It was probably leaves on the windows here all day. I didn't think so. The existence of evil powers. That's true. Those are out there. Uh, we're going to talk about those. Cockroaches, spiders, snakes, heights, water, enclosed spaces. I just got half of you right there. Uh, let's see. Uh, tunnels, bridges, needles, social rejection, failure, examinations, public speaking. Uh... Snakes, flying, spiders, insects, enclosed spaces, all that. Area. Mice, dogs, thunder and lightning. I like a good thunder and lightning deal. Uh, and then here's the top of three of these. 
Fear of failure, fear of abandonment, fear of death. Pretty healthy lips. And, and fear is one of Satan's most wonderful tools that he uses against us. He, he can guide and direct us and turn us in a lot of directions as a result of fear. He can shut us down as a result of fear. And, and we as Christians are end up being afraid just like everybody else of things out in this world. But we as Christians also know there's something else that is there to take away the fear in our lives. And that we are to tap into a Paul prays about it for us today in our epistle lesson in Ephesians. And he leads us into this prayer that talks about being strengthened through the Spirit, which leads us into faith, which leads us into a relationship with Jesus, which leads us ultimately into his love. And his prayer is that we understand the magnitude and the power of God's love for us. And it is at that point that our fears are washed away. And it is replaced with peace and comfort and knowing God's love. And we need that. We need that in our lives. Because Satan is working on us. And, you, and, and there are things that we should be afraid of. And things in this world that, that we need to stand back and give a little bit of room for. But at the same time, there's so many things that we cannot let take over us and take over our lives. Now, there is a type of fear that we should have, and that is a fear for sin. We should have a fear. And, and one thing that the, the Reformation period, and people of the time of the Reformation, when I say that, during the time of Luther back in the 1500s, they had a very almost unhealthy fear of God, but it was a fear of God in, in a good way in that you didn't want to sin, and you knew that there were consequences of sin. And see, we live in a world right now very much that is completely opposite of that. We live in a world that understands there is no consequence for sin. First of all, you have to believe in a God. You have to believe there is a judge that you're going to have to encounter at some point uh, when you die. And... I don't think a lot of people even really truly believe that. Or they believe that, okay, there's something out there that as long as I'm basically good, I'm good. As long as I haven't murdered, killed anybody, I'm okay. And we live in a world that does not respect God nor fear God. We saw that in the uh, uh, one of the things of the opening of the ceremonies, and I didn't even watch it, I was told about it, one of the parts of the opening ceremonies of the Olympics, where they were mocking God. See, that's just an example of the world does not fear God. And that shouldn't surprise us. That shouldn't shock us. It does. I have to admit that does kind of shock you. But it really shouldn't because in a world where they do not believe in God or respect God nor fear God, anything goes. So that shouldn't surprise us. Where we need to be careful is within the church, we as Christians, we should have a fear of God in the sense that we know he doesn't want us to sin and it's not right for us to sin. But see, we in the church embrace all those kind of sins and things on our own and, and think not much about them. Or we pick certain ones that are on the list that are really bad. In other words, the people mocking Jesus, that's really bad. Or people that are engaged in that kind of behavior. Those are horribly bad. But then we do kind of pick and choose as to which sins are bad and which are not. I'm amazed at how many of these just typical sins that we as Christians engage in. Let me go to Romans chapter 1. Verse 28. And they did not see fit to acknowledge God. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. In other words, those who do not believe in God have rejected him. God said, okay, you manage without me. And uh, they were filled with all manner of unrighteous evil, covetous, malice. They are full of envy, 
murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. That's those on the outside of God's kingdom. But then we have to be careful for those inside of God's kingdom. Those of us that do understand we are saved by grace. So I'm saved by grace, but it's okay if I gossip. It's okay if I say bad things about other people. It's okay if I'm promiscuous. It's okay if I'm unfaithful to my spouse. See, we kind of pick and choose, and, and it's amazing how within Christianity, we've said all these things are okay. Not verbally would we say such a thing, but would we ever practice those things? Absolutely. And there is a need to be fearful. Because those things do lead us into the judgment of God. Wonderfully, it is at that point that God takes us to the cross. That God has a plan of salvation for us. He does have a rescue plan. And it is that rescue plan that, that we have grasped onto. And we do that by the work of the Holy Spirit. God's wonderful means of grace. And we're talking about that in Sunday school right now. And what are those means of grace? The message of the gospel, baptism, communion, those things in which God works within us and brings us to himself and brings us into a relationship with him. It is there that we find the comfort and the peace and the strength of God. But it's important that, that we do. You know, there's understand you know there is a judgment there is a god and, and when we understand that we also understand the magnitude and the power of god's forgiveness and his grace so for example many years ago there's a story about the king of hungary okay and he is feeling pretty burdened by his recent life where he has been kind of sinful in his practice and things he's been doing and he, and he calls on his brother as a prince to come counsel with him. And, and his brother kind of said, well, first thing, the king said to him, I'm a great sinner. I fear to be God. But the prince only laughed at him. Uh, this didn't help the king's disposition, it says. Though he was a believer, the king had gotten a glimpse of his guilt for the way he'd been living lately. And he seriously wanted help. And his brother provided that for him. So what he did, back in those days, uh, when you were in deep trouble and you were going to be executed, the, next, uh, 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 the executioner would show up at your doorstep and they would blow a trumpet and, and come in and get you and take you out to be executed. He sent the executioner to his brother's door in the middle of the night. And, and blew the trumpet, brother scared to death, called brother out, took him to the king, and of course the brother's shaking in his boots at this time, trembling, what have I done, you know, to offend you this way? And, and, and the king addresses him, and the king says, here you are, scared to death, but for your life, with an earthly death, and here I taught you about uh, the consequence of sin and eternal death, and you laugh at all. And this point made to his brother, this is serious. Now the answer to the king, the answer to us, is what? The message of the gospel. The message that there's no way that I can appease God by my life, by what I do. And, and I have good reason to fear God. God takes away that fear by introducing us by faith to our Savior, Jesus. Through Jesus, we understand God's wrath has been appeased, has been taken care of through his Son. Through his suffering, his death, his resurrection, God has a plan of salvation for us. And it is through that 
understanding who Jesus is that we deal with fear. And first and foremost, the most greatest one, and that is the fear of death, and the fear of God's judgment. And we, as God's people, do not have to share in that fear. Instead, he brings us peace. And he brings us understanding that I can lay my head on my pillow. I don't have to worry about an executioner showing up at the door because I'm good with God. And that does influence and affect our lives. And it does, by his spirit, God and direct us. And it helps us to deal with fear. Look at all of the different ways all the different people in the Bible had to deal with fear. And through every one of them, it had to be by the grace of God that they overcame it and dealt with it. And for us, we are no different. We have our fears in this world. And, and also, too, we have a way to deal with it, and that is through the grace of God. Let me share with you here a couple things. Uh, First of all, second page. First of all, the prayer that Paul has there. I'm looking at that for a second. And let me give you the context of this prayer just a little bit. Paul has been talking about, you know, the division that there was in the church and how God has brought the church together, both Jew and Gentile. And how he has established them through the, the, the prophets and the apostles and the word of God. He's established and put together the church. And yet there are challenges. Paul has these challenges that he writes about. And that he is suffering. And that he has these challenges of taking this gospel into the world. And we also share in those challenges of taking the gospel into the world. What is one of the number one things that Satan uses is to keep us from taking that message into the world? Fear. Some of those things I just listed. Fear. And how does Paul talk about overcoming those fears? And this is where he leads into this prayer. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant you to be one, strengthened through the power of the Holy Spirit. What happens through the means of grace, through the message of the gospel, through baptism, even through communion? The Holy Spirit arrives and comes through. And what does he wonderfully do? He connects us by faith into Jesus. Uh, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, the result of being grounded in Jesus, is you are grounded in his love. And then he prays, and this is where I love uh, this, this concept. He does it in, in chapter 1, he does it here in chapter 3 of Ephesians. This concept, this understanding that, that as Christians we grow, we mature, we grow in our understanding. And here he wants us to grow in our understanding in the height, the magnitude, the depth of, of God's love. So as we continue in God's word, as we grow in faith, we grow in understanding God's love. And understanding that love is what grounds us. It is what gives us stability to deal with the things of the world. So we as Christians join with Paul in this prayer. Pray, Lord, help me to grow in understanding your love, your work in my life. Help me to understand even more so the cross and what you have done for me. And as we understand the cross more so and, and what Jesus has done for us, we understand how blessed we are. We understand our baptism and what that makes us in Christ. And, and it is through that that we deal with fear. And take your pick of whatever fear it may be. I found a, uh, this list in uh, on the internet. I thought it was a good one. Uh, let's see. Let me go. Me and all my sheets of paper. We're 
Let me see so I get better at this. There it is. Last one. It's always the last place you look. Uh, this was a, on a website. It was labeled Mercy Multiplied Simple Steps to Overcoming Fear. Okay? So I'm not taking credit for this. Uh, I added to it, though, because uh, they had a list of about five things here, and I overlaid on that Ephesians chapter 6. We'll get into that in a, in a few weeks. But in Ephesians chapter 6 is the armor of God, right? And in Ephesians chapter 6, it does talk about what we deal with in the world, that we have reason to be concerned because we're dealing with principalities, powers, dark forces in the world, evil in the world. It is out there for us. And, and we do not take that lightly as Christians. We understand the enemy. And we understand how he uses fear to, to deal with us. But this list I thought was helpful. Uh, their number one thing was invite God into your fear. Sometimes you may not even know why you are fearful or not know where to begin fighting fear. Letting God speak into your fear and giving him space to reveal himself is an essential step in this process. Pray for God to reveal the root of fear and allow him to speak truth over your fear. And I put on that just full armor of God. That is the entry to the full armor of God, is, is understanding I need God, I need his resources and his help to deal with these challenges in my life. And he has provided things to equip me. Two, realize the power of your thoughts and words. And I have next to that gospel of peace, your feet shod with the gospel of peace. What is our strength? What is the message of the gospel? It is the message of the gospel that, that works within our own hearts and also is what will work on the hearts of others. So, three, replace the lie of fear with the truth of God's word. Right out of Ephesians chapter 6, the belt of truth, the sword of the spirit. God's word is what we tap into. Whenever we are having to deal with fear and whatever those things are bringing us here, what is the truth? What is God's truth? How does he speak to this that would be causing me fear? So we tap into God's word and truth. Uh, number four, uh, partner with prayer warriors. You never were meant to fight fear alone. Find people that you trust and ask them to partner in prayer with you. Make a group text or make some time once a week to connect with your partners to keep you accountable throughout this process. Wonderful encouragement. Also, I have next step, praying in the spirit. And also, too, reminded where two or more are gathered, God's there and he's answering prayers. And, and it's a beautiful thing. And we have that within this community where we have each other to pray with, to encourage each other in prayer, share in prayer, share in challenges, and, and also brings accountability and help. And then they have the last thing here. Trust the process of overcoming fear. Be patient. Finally, be patient and trust the process. Restraining your mind to think differently about overcoming fear will take time. But know that the, in the process of God in the process of allowing God to work in your heart and speaking truth over the lives of fear. You are already fighting from the place of victory in Christ. And then, of course, uh, I had already tapped into this verse. They bring this verse here in. It's out of 1 John 4, 8. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. Where's that perfect love found? In Jesus. Where do we deal with fear? Through Jesus. And we all have them. And, and you can pick any day where we have different things that we're battling or being challenged by. And Satan's going to continue to use it as a wonderful weapon. But the disciples on the water were comforted by learning who Jesus was. And they're still in that learning process. Understanding who he is as God. And, and they watched him feed the masses. They watched him walk on water. Uh, and, and 
They watched him heal people, and they still were kind of hard to heart. God hadn't opened the door for them yet. If Pentecost, he would open the door through the work of the Holy Spirit. Through us, he has opened that same door through our baptism, through the message of the gospel, to understand and see God as our God, as our strength. So we continue to pray, continue to pray, uh, that God helps us grow in understanding the love he has for us, his love at work in the world, and his love that was at work on the cross for us.